Section 1. Hello, Linda speaking. Oh, hi, Linda. This is Matt Brooks. Alex White gave me your number. He said you'd be able to give me some advice about moving to Banford. Yes, Alex did mention you. How can I help? Well, first of all, which area to live in? Well, I live in Dalton, which is a really nice suburb. Not too expensive, and there's a nice park. Sounds good. Do you know how much it would be to rent a two-bedroom flat there? Yeah, you should be able to get something reasonable for £850 per month. That's what people typically pay. You certainly wouldn't want to pay more than £900. That doesn't include bills or anything. No, that sounds all right. I'll definitely have a look there. Are the transport links easy from where you live? Well, I'm very lucky. I work in the city centre, so I don't have to use public transport. I go by bike. Oh, I wish I could do that. Is it safe to cycle around the city? Yes, it's fine. And it keeps me fit. Anyway, driving to work in the city centre would be a nightmare because there's hardly any parking. And the traffic during the rush hour can be bad. I'd be working from home, but I'd have to go to London one or two days a week. Oh, that's perfect. Getting to London is no problem. There's a fast train every 30 minutes, which only takes 45 minutes. That's good. Yeah, the train service isn't bad during the week, and they run quite late at night. It's weekends that are a problem. They're always doing engineering work, and you have to take a bus to Haddam and pick up the train there, which is really slow. But other than that, Banford's a great place to live. I've never been happier. There are some nice restaurants in the city centre and a brand new cinema, which has only been open a couple of months. There's a good art centre too. Sounds like Banford's got it all. Yes, we're really lucky. There are lots of really good aspects to living here. The schools are good, and the hospital here is one of the best in the country. Everyone I know who's been there's had a positive experience. Oh, I can give you the name of my dentist too, in Bridge Street, if you're interested. I've been going to him for years, and I've never had any problems. Oh, OK, thanks. I'll find his number and send it to you. Thanks. That would be really helpful. Are you planning to visit Banford soon? Yes. My wife and I are both coming next week. We want to make some appointments with estate agents. I could meet you if you like and show you around. Are you sure? We'd really appreciate that. Either Tuesday or Thursday is good for me, after 5.30. Thursday's preferable. Tuesday, I need to get home before 6 p.m. OK. Great. Let me know which train you're catching and I'll meet you in the cafe outside. You can't miss it. It's opposite the station and next to the museum. Brilliant. I'll text you next week then. Thanks so much for all the advice. No problem. I'll see you next week. Section 2 So, if you're one of those people who hasn't found the perfect physical activity yet, 
Here are some things to think about which might help you make the right decision for you. The first question to ask yourself is whether you would enjoy training in a gym. Many people are put off by the idea of having to fit a visit to the gym into their busy day. You often have to go very early or late, as some gyms can get very crowded. But with regular training, you'll see a big difference in a relatively short space of time. Running has become incredibly popular in recent years. That's probably got a lot to do with the fact that it's a very accessible form of exercise. Anyone can run, even if you can only run a few metres to begin with. But make sure you get the right shoes. It's worth investing in a high-quality pair, and they don't come cheap. Another great thing about running is that you can do it at any time of day or night. The only thing that may stop you is snow and ice. Swimming is another really good way to build fitness. What attracts many people is that you can swim in an indoor pool at any time of year. On the other hand, it can be quite boring or solitary. It's hard to chat to people while you're swimming lengths. Cycling has become almost as popular as running in recent years. That's probably because, as well as improving their fitness, many people say being out in the fresh air in a park or in the countryside can be fun. Provided the conditions are right, of course. Only fanatics go out in the wind and rain. Yoga is a good choice for those of you looking for exercise which focuses on developing both a healthy mind and body. It's a good way of building strength, and with the right instructor, there's less chance of hurting yourself than with other more active sports. But don't expect to find it easy. It can be surprisingly challenging, especially for people who aren't very flexible. Getting a personal trainer is a good way to start your fitness program. Obviously, there can be significant costs involved. But if you've got someone there to encourage you and help you achieve your goals, you're less likely to give up. Make sure you get someone with a recognised qualification, though, or you could do yourself permanent damage. Whatever you do, don't join a gym unless you're sure you'll make good use of it. So many people waste lots of money by signing up for membership and then hardly ever go. What happens to their good intentions? I don't think people suddenly stop caring about improving their fitness or decide they have more important things to do. I think people lose interest when they don't think they're making enough progress. That's when they give up hope and stop believing they'll ever achieve their goals. Also, what people sometimes don't realise when they start is that it takes a lot of determination and hard work to keep training week after week, and lots of people don't have that kind of commitment. One thing you can do to help yourself is to set manageable goals. Be realistic and don't push yourself too far. Some people advise writing goals down, but I think it's better to have a flexible approach. Give yourself a really nice treat every time you reach one of your goals. And don't get too upset if you experience setbacks. It's a journey. There are bound to be difficulties along the way. Section 3 OK, Jim. You wanted to see me about your textile design project. That's right. I've been looking at how a range of natural dyes can be used to colour fabrics like cotton and wool. Why did you choose that topic? Well, I got a lot of useful ideas from the museum, you know, at that exhibition of textiles. But I've always been interested in anything to do with colour. Years ago, I went to a carpet shop with my parents when we were on holiday in Turkey, and I remember all the amazing colours. They might not all have been natural dyes. Maybe not. But for the project, I decided to follow it up. And I found a great book about a botanic garden in California that specialises in plants used for dyes. OK. So in your project, you had to include a practical investigation. Yeah. At first, I couldn't decide on my variables. 
I was going to just look at one type of fibre, for example, like cotton. And see how different types of dyes affected it? Yes. Then I decided to include others as well. So I looked at cotton and wool and nylon. With just one type of dye? Various types, including some that weren't natural, for comparison. OK. So I did the experiments last week. I used some ready-made natural dyes. I found a website which supplied them. They came in just a few days, but I also made some of my own. That must have taken quite a bit of time. Yes. I thought it'd just be a matter of a teaspoon or so of dye, and actually that wasn't the case at all. Like, I was using one vegetable, a beetroot, for a red dye, and I had to chop up a whole pile of it. So it all took longer than I'd expected. One possibility is to use food colourings. I did use one. That was a yellow dye, an artificial one. Tatrazine? Yeah. I used it on cotton first. It came out a great colour. But when I rinsed the material, the colour just washed away. I'd been going to try it out on nylon, but I abandoned that idea. Were you worried about health issues? I thought if it's a legal food colouring, it must be safe. Well, it can occasionally cause allergic reactions, I believe. So what natural dyes did you look at? Well, one was turmeric. The colour's great. It's a really strong yellow. It's generally used in dishes like curry. It's meant to be quite good for your health when eaten, but you might find it's not permanent when it's used as a dye. A few washes and it's gone. Right. I used beetroot as a dye for wool. When I chop up beetroot to eat, I always end up with bright red hands. But the wool ended up just a sort of watery cream shade. Disappointing. There's a natural dye called Tyrian purple. Have you heard of that? Yes. It comes from a shellfish. And it was worn in ancient times, but only by important people, as it was so rare. I didn't use it. It fell out of use centuries ago, though one researcher managed to get hold of some recently. But that shade of purple can be produced by chemical dyes nowadays. Did you use any black dyes? Logwood. That was quite complicated. I had to prepare the fabric so the dye would take. I hope you were careful to wear gloves. Yes, I know the danger with that dye. Good, it can be extremely dangerous if it's ingested. Now, presumably you had a look at an insect-based dye, like cochineal, for example. Yes, I didn't actually make that. I didn't have time to start crushing up insects to get the red colour. And anyway, they're not available here. But I managed to get the dye quite easily from a website. But it cost a fortune. I can see why it's generally just used in cooking and in small quantities. A lot of work. Section 4 Last week we started looking at reptiles, including crocodiles and snakes. Today, I'd like us to have a look at another reptile, the lizard, and in particular, at some studies that have been done on a particular type of lizard whose Latin name is Taliqua rugosa. This is commonly known as the sleepy lizard because it's quite slow in its movements and spends quite a lot of its time dozing under rocks or lying in the sun. I'll start with a general description. Sleepy lizards live in Western and South Australia, where they're quite common. Unlike European lizards, which are mostly small, green and fast-moving, sleepy lizards are brown, but what's particularly distinctive about them is the colour of their tongue, which is dark blue, in contrast with the lining of their mouth, which is bright pink. And they're much bigger than most European lizards, they have quite a varied diet, including insects and even small animals, but they mostly eat plants of varying kinds. Even though they're quite large and powerful, with strong jaws that can crush beetles and snail shells, they still have quite a few predators. Large birds like cassowaries were one of the main ones in the past, but nowadays they're more likely to be caught and killed by snakes. Actually, another threat to their survival isn't a predator at all, but is man-made. Quite a large number of sleepy lizards are killed by cars when they're trying to cross highways. One study carried out by Michael Freak at Flinders University investigated the methods of navigation of these lizards. Though they move slowly, they can travel quite long distances. 
and he found that even if they were taken some distance away from their home territory, they could usually find their way back home as long as they could see the sky. They didn't need any other landmarks on the ground. Observations of these lizards in the wild have also revealed that their mating habits are quite unusual. Unlike most animals, it seems that they're relatively monogamous, returning to the same partner year after year. And the male and female also stay together for a long time, both before and after the birth of their young. It's quite interesting to think about the possible reasons for this. It could be that it's to do with protecting their young. You'd expect them to have a much better chance of survival if they have both parents around. But in fact, observers have noted that once the babies have hatched out of their eggs, they have hardly any contact with their parents. So there's not really any evidence to support that idea. Another suggestion is based on the observation that male lizards in monogamous relationships tend to be bigger and stronger than other males. So maybe the male lizards stay around so they can give the female lizards protection from other males. But again, we're not really sure. Finally, I'd like to mention another study that involved collecting data by tracking the lizards. I was actually involved in this myself. So we caught some lizards in the wild and we developed a tiny GPS system that would allow us to track them and we fix this onto their tails. Then we set the lizards free again, and we were able to track them for 12 days and gather data, not just about their location, but even about how many steps they took during this period. One surprising thing we discovered from this is that there were far fewer meetings between lizards than we expected. It seems that they were actually trying to avoid one another. So why would that be? Well, again, we have no clear evidence, but one hypothesis is that male lizards can cause quite serious injuries to one another. So maybe this avoidance is a way of preventing this, of self-preservation, if you like. But we need to collect a lot more data before we can be sure of any of this. Section 1 Hi, Alex. It's Martha Klein's here. James White gave me your number. I hope you don't mind me calling you. Of course not. How are you, Martha? Good, thanks. I'm ringing because I need a bit of advice. Oh, yeah? What about? The training you did at JPNW a few years ago. I'm applying for the same thing. Oh, right, yes. I did mine in 2014. Best thing I ever did. I'm still working there. Really? What are you doing? Well, now I work in the customer services department, but I did my initial training in finance. I stayed there for the first two years and then moved to where I am now. That's the same department I'm applying for. Did you enjoy it? Uh, I was pretty nervous to begin with. I didn't do well in my exams at school and I was really worried because I failed maths. But it didn't actually matter because I did lots of courses on the job. Did you get a diploma at the end of your trainee period? I'm hoping to do the one in business skills. Yes, that sounds good. I took the one on IT skills, but I wish I'd done that one instead. OK, that's good to know. Um, what about the other trainees? How did you get on with them? There were about 20 of us who started at the same time, and we were all around the same age. I was 18, and there was only one person younger than me who was 17. The rest were between 18 and 20. I made some good friends. I've heard lots of good things about the training at JPNW. It seems like there are a lot of opportunities there. Yeah, definitely. Because of its size, you can work in loads of different areas within the organisation. What about pay? I know you get a lower minimum wage than regular employees. That's right, which isn't great. But you get the same number of days holiday as everyone else, and the pay goes up massively if they offer you a job at the end of the training period. Yeah, but I'm not doing it for the money. It's the experience I think will be really useful. Everyone says by the end of the year you gain so much confidence. You're right, that's the most useful part about it. 
There's a lot of variety too. You're given lots of different things to do. I enjoyed it all. I didn't even mind the studying. Do you have to spend any time in college? Yes, one day each month. So you get lots of support from both your tutor and your manager. Hmm, that's good. And the company is easy to get to, isn't it? Yes, it's very close to the train station, so the location's a real advantage. Have you got a date for your interview yet? Yes, it's on the 23rd of this month. So long as you're well prepared, there's nothing to worry about. Everyone's very friendly. I am not sure what I should wear. What do you think? Nothing too casual, like jeans, for example. If you've got a nice jacket, wear that with a skirt or trousers. OK, thanks. Any other tips? Um, well, I know it's really obvious, but arrive in plenty of time. They hate people who are late. So make sure you know exactly where you have to get to. And one other useful piece of advice my manager told me before I had the interview for this job is to smile. Even if you feel terrified, it makes people respond better to you. <laughs> I'll have to practice doing that in the mirror. <laughs> yeah, well, good luck. Let me know if you need any more information. Thanks very much. Section 2 Hi everyone, welcome to the Snow Centre. My name's Annie. I hope you enjoyed the bus trip from the airport. We've certainly got plenty of snow today. Well, you've come to New Zealand's premier snow and ski centre and we've a whole load of activities for you during your week here. Most visitors come here for the cross-country skiing where you're on fairly flat ground for most of the time rather than going down steep mountainsides. There are marked trails, but you can also leave these and go off on your own, and that's an experience not to be missed. You can go at your own speed. It's great aerobic exercise if you really push yourself. Or, if you prefer, you can just glide gently along and enjoy the beautiful scenery. This afternoon, you'll be going on a dog sled trip. You may have seen our dogs on TV recently racing in the Winter Sled Festival. If you want, you can have your own team for the afternoon and learn how to drive them, following behind our leader on the trail. Or if you'd prefer, you can just sit back in the sled and enjoy the ride as a passenger. At the weekend, we have the team relay event and you're all welcome to join in. We have a local school coming along and a lot of the teachers are taking part too. Participation rather than winning is the main focus and there's a medal for everyone who takes part. Participants are in teams of two to four and each team must complete four laps of the course. For your final expedition, you'll head off to Mount Frenna wearing a pair of special snowshoes which allow you to walk on top of the snow. This is an area where miners once searched for gold though there are very few traces of their work left now. When the snow melts in summer, the mountain slopes are carpeted in flowers and plants. It's a long ascent, though not too steep, and walkers generally take a couple of days to get to the summit and return. You'll spend the night in our hut halfway up the mountain. That's included in your package for the stay. It's got cooking facilities, firewood and water for drinking. For washing, we recommend you use melted snow, though, to conserve supplies. We can take your luggage up on our snowmobile for you for just $10 a person. The hut has cooking facilities, so you can make a hot meal in the evening and morning, but you need to take your own food. The weather on Mount Frenna can be very stormy. In that case, stay in the hut. Generally, the storms don't last long. Don't stress about getting back here to the centre in time to catch the airport bus. They'll probably not be running anyway. We do have an emergency locator beacon in the hut, but only use that if it's a real emergency, like if someone's ill or injured. Now, let me tell you something about the different ski trails you can follow during your stay here. Highland Trail's directly accessible from where we are now. This trail's been designed to give first-timers an experience they'll enjoy regardless of their age or skill, but it's also ideal for experts to practice their technique. Then there's Pine Trail. If you're nervous about skiing, leave this one to the experts. 
You follow a steep valley looking right down on the river below. Scary! But if you've fully mastered the techniques needed for hills, it's great fun. Stony trails are a good choice once you've got a general idea of the basics. There are one or two tricky sections, but nothing too challenging. There's a shelter halfway where you can sit and take a break and enjoy the afternoon sunshine. And finally, Loser's Trail. This starts off following a gentle river valley, but the last part is quite exposed, so the snow conditions can be challenging. If it's snowing or windy, check with us before you set out to make sure the trail's open that day. Right, so now if you'd like to follow me, we'll get started. Section 3 I've still got loads to do for our report on nutritional food labels. Me too. What did you learn from doing the project about your own shopping habits? Well, I've always had to check labels for traces of peanuts in everything I eat because of my allergy. But beyond that, I've never really been concerned enough to check how healthy a product is. This project has actually taught me to read the labels much more carefully. I tended to believe claims on packaging, like low in fat. But I now realise that the healthy yoghurt I've bought for years is full of sugar and that it's actually quite high in calories. Mm. Ready meals are the worst. Comparing the labels on supermarket pizzas was a real eye-opener. Did you have any idea how many calories they contain? I was amazed. Yes, because unless you read the label really carefully, you wouldn't know that the nutritional values given are for half a pizza. When most people eat the whole pizza. Not exactly transparent, is it? Not at all. But I expect it won't stop you from buying pizza. Probably not, no. I thought comparing the different labelling systems used by food manufacturers was interesting. I think the kind of labelling system used makes a big difference. Which one did you prefer? I liked the traditional daily value system best, the one which tells you what proportion of your required daily intake of each ingredient the product contains. I'm not sure it's the easiest for people to use, but at least you get the full story. I like to know all the ingredients in a product, not just how much fat, salt and sugar they contain. But it's good supermarkets have been making an effort to provide reliable information for customers. Yes. There just needs to be more consistency between labelling systems used by different supermarkets in terms of portion sizes, etc. Hmm. The labels on the different brands of chicken flavour crisps were quite revealing too, weren't they? Yeah. I don't understand how they can get away with calling them chicken flavour when they only contain artificial additives. I know. I'd at least have expected them to contain a small percentage of real chicken. Absolutely. I think having nutritional food labelling has been a good idea, don't you? I think it will change people's behaviour and stop mothers, in particular, buying the wrong things. But didn't that study kind of prove the opposite? People didn't necessarily stop buying unhealthy products. They only said that might be the case. Those findings weren't that conclusive, and it was quite a small-scale study. I think more research has to be done. Yes, I think you're probably right. What do you think of the traffic light system? I think supermarkets like the idea of having a colour-coded system, red, orange or green, for levels of fat, sugar and salt in a product. But it's not been adopted universally, and not on all products. Why do you suppose that is? Pressure from the food manufacturers. Hardly surprising that some of them are opposed to flagging up how unhealthy their products are. I'd have thought it would have been compulsory. It seems ridiculous it isn't. I know. And what I couldn't get over is the fact that it was brought in without enough consultation. A lot of experts had deep reservations about it. That is a bit weird. I suppose there's an argument for doing the research now when consumers are familiar with this system. Yeah, maybe. 
The participants in the survey were quite positive about the traffic light system. Hmm. But I don't think they targeted the right people. They should have focused on people with low literacy levels because these labels are designed to be accessible to them. Yeah. But it's good to get feedback from all socio-economic groups. And there wasn't much variation in their responses. No. But if they hadn't interviewed participants face-to-face, -face, they could have used a much bigger sample size. I wonder why they chose that method. Dunno. How were they selected? Did they volunteer or were they approached? I think they volunteered. The thing that wasn't stated was how often they bought packaged food. All we know is how frequently they use the supermarket. Section 4 In my presentation, I'm going to talk about coffee and its importance both in economic and social terms. We think it was first drunk in the Arab world, but there's hardly any documentary evidence of it before the 1500s. Although, of course, that doesn't mean that people didn't know about it before then. However, there is evidence that coffee was originally gathered from bushes growing wild in Ethiopia, in the northeast of Africa. In the early 16th century, it was being bought by traders, and gradually its use as a drink spread throughout the Middle East. It's also known that in 1522, in the Turkish city of Constantinople, which was the centre of the Ottoman Empire, the court physician approved its use as a medicine. By the mid-1500s, coffee bushes were being cultivated in the Yemen, and for the next hundred years, this region produced most of the coffee drunk in Africa and the Arab world. What's particularly interesting about coffee is its effect on social life. It was rarely drunk at home, but instead people went to coffee houses to drink it. These people, usually men, would meet to drink coffee and chat about issues of the day. But at the time, this chance to share ideas and opinions was seen as something that was potentially dangerous. And in 1623, the ruler of Constantinople demanded the destruction of all the coffee houses in the city, although after his death, many new ones opened and coffee consumption continued. In the 17th century, coffee drinking spread to Europe, and here too, coffee shops became places where ordinary people, nearly always men, could meet to exchange ideas. Because of this, some people said that these places performed a similar function to universities. The opportunity they provided for people to meet together outside their own homes and to discuss the topics of the day had an enormous impact on social life, and many social movements and political developments had their origins in coffee house discussions. In the late 1600s, the Yemeni monopoly on coffee production broke down, and coffee production started to spread around the world, helped by European colonisation. Europeans set up coffee plantations in Indonesia and the Caribbean, and production of coffee in the colonies skyrocketed. Different types of coffee were produced in different areas, and it's interesting that the names given to these different types, like mocha or java coffee, were often taken from the port they were shipped to Europe from. But if you look at the labour system in the different colonies, there were some significant differences. In Brazil and the various Caribbean colonies, coffee was grown in huge plantations, and the workers there were almost all slaves. But this wasn't the same in all colonies. For example, in Java, which had been colonised by the Dutch, the peasants grew coffee and passed a proportion of this on to the Dutch, so it was used as a means of taxation. But whatever system was used, under the European powers of the 18th century, coffee production was very closely linked to colonisation. Coffee was grown in ever-increasing quantities to satisfy the growing demand from Europe, 
and it became nearly as important as sugar production, which was grown under very similar conditions. However, coffee prices were not yet low enough for people to drink it regularly at home, so most coffee consumptions still took place in public coffee houses, and it still remained something of a luxury item. In Britain, however, a new drink was introduced from China and started to become popular, gradually taking over from coffee, although at first it was so expensive that only the upper classes could afford it. This was tea, and by the late 1700s it was being widely drunk. However, when the USA gained independence from Britain in 1776, they identified this drink with Britain, and coffee remained the preferred drink in the USA, as it still is today. So, by the early 19th century, coffee was already being widely produced and consumed. But during this century, production boomed and coffee prices started to fall. This was partly because new types of transportation had been developed, which were cheaper and more efficient. So now, working people could afford to buy coffee. It wasn't just a drink for the middle classes. And this was at a time when large parts of Europe were starting to work in industries. And sometimes this meant their work didn't stop when it got dark. They might have to continue throughout the night. So the use of coffee as a stimulant became important. It wasn't just a drink people drank in the morning for breakfast. There were also changes in cultivation.